<coughs> there is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said, this also is vanity. And I commend joy, for man has no good thing under the sun, but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night uh, do one eye see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out, the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who fears, uh, sorry, he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. But the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their, and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Go, eat your bread with joy. And drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the grave to which you are going. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance or time and events happen to them all. For man does not know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it, and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Amen.
Well, we turn to Ecclesiastes this morning again. Uh, we are now in the second half of the book, uh, and we are in the second half of chapter 9 this morning. Uh, but what we're going to be thinking about this morning in the second half of chapter 9, uh, we began last week uh, as we um, took up our study from chapter 8 and verse 14 uh, through uh, to the um, beginning of chapter 9. We have said that Ecclesiastes is this fascinating study uh, of life as we experience it in this world. And it deals with um, two different situations uh, in regard to life in a broken, fallen world where it is impossible for us by our human own human reason and logic to make sense of the world. Uh, it first of all um, tells us that though people think because of all the bad things that are happening in the world that there is no God, there is indeed a God, a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all-wise. And so that's a challenge to those who are skeptics and who say there's nothing under the sun, nothing, sorry, nothing beyond the sun, and who say life is pointless and meaningless. And so in answer to the question, what is the point of life? We've seen and we've come now to that point in the study where Solomon, the king who wrote this book, says wisdom is the point of life. And he says to you who believe, that is wonderfully helpful because there are things that happen in your life and my life, things that happen in the church, things that happen in our wider families. As believers, and they can send us reeling. Why did that happen? Where is God in the midst of this? Why did God allow this to happen to me? Indeed, for some people, it can be a, um, almost an earthquake-like experience. But again, Solomon is saying, wisdom is the answer. Now, we've said that wisdom is not a theory. It's not philosophy. It's not something you get out of a textbook. It's not something that you get by having a, a counselor or a coach in life. Wisdom is a, a God-centered life that is looking to Jesus Christ. That summed up Solomon in all his... Um, imperfections uh, and in all his sins he was nonetheless beloved of God Jedida uh, he was one who had a God centered life that was looking beyond the sacrifices beyond the rituals of his day beyond the tabernacle and the temple that he built to the Christ who would tabernacle with men and women in this world. And so today, wisdom for you and me in uh, the, all these things in life. And as we speak into an unbelieving world, wisdom for you and me is to have a God-centered life that looks to the Christ who has come as Jesus of Nazareth and who has laid down his life as the ransom for our sins and who has risen again, taking up that life, showing that God has accepted fully, completely, wonderfully his sacrifice for your sin, for my sin, for our sin. What a way to look at life. And that's the heart of the book of Proverbs. But now in this second part, um, Solomon is applying this uh, to, um, I believe, the church of the old. Testament. And we are in this study thinking about four anchor points. 
We might call them, uh, if you think of a picture frame, think of a jigsaw, building a jigsaw. You get the corners in place, first of all, and then you get the straight edge, and then you can um, move around to the parts, and usually, eventually, we get the jigsaw built. Now, we will not get the jigsaw of life together completely in this life, or indeed, and in maybe in any major part, but we can have the four corners in place and the straight edge that comes out from those for our lives. We saw last week that the first one of those anchor points or corner points is God's ways are past finding out. That's not, we're not talking about his way of salvation. It is clear. It is wonderfully um, to be found out in scripture, which brings us to Christ. But his ways in his providence, in his control of this world, the things that he allows to happen, they are past finding out. Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 8. But then we saw, secondly, our times are in God's hands. So when trouble comes into my life that I have not been expecting, when it almost knocks me over sideways, uh, or once uh, could lead me in another path, I say I need to remember God's ways are beyond finding out in my life. But his purpose is perfect for me, for his people, for his world. But then in my particular circumstance, I can say my times are in God's hands. And so things uh, happen exactly as he purposed and planned. And um, as I go through this time of difficulty and challenge every day, my um, responsibility, my privilege is to put my life again and again in his hands and say, Lord, give me grace for today. So that took us to chapter 9 and verse 6. So. This morning, we have two further points that we want to make. Point three in the, uh, or the third corner or the third anchor um, in the boat of life. And it is this, enjoy God's good gifts. And then we will see fourthly and finally, outcomes in life uh, are under God's control, not our control. So let's think first of all then about enjoy God's good gifts. I don't know whether you've noticed or not, I hope you have, but how often Solomon talks about food, about drink. He's not talking here about getting drunk, but he's talking about those things that are necessary to sustain the body. He talks about a wife and children and marriage. And he talks about that over against the toil and the trouble that we often experience in life. And Solomon says, these things here are God's good gifts to us in a difficult, fallen, broken, sinful world where sin brings misery. And these good gifts um, help me to uh, hold fast and to keep anchored and to keep going in a straight line in the midst of all kinds of experiences. People today question, is God good? How can God be good? Look at all the suffering that's happening in the world. How can you speak to me of a good God? We'll come back to that later. But let's be clear. And boys, let's be clear. The Bible teaches and Christians believe God is good. Always good. Even when things that are bad and difficult and heartbreaking happen in our lives. 
We read there from James chapter 1, um, verse 17, at the beginning of our service. And we saw there and we see there, he is the source of all good. Every good gift comes from above. Notice how often that phrase comes in Scripture, from above. Good gifts, true faith, true religion doesn't come from the bottom up. It comes from heaven down. Good things people enjoy don't come from earth up. It's not simply the product of hard work and, um, and applying themselves and, and getting good breaks in life. No, those good things that people have come down from above, the ungodly, equally. God causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. And so uh, God, on the opposite then, if we want to put it against the dark cloth, as we're thinking about in our catechism question at the beginning of our prayer time, the dark cloth uh, is that there is evil in the world, but God is not the source of evil. God does not approve of evil, but he does in his grace and power Order, order and govern evil to his own holy ends and for our good. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. For we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. How wonderful to know that. And so having examined life from the viewpoint of the unbeliever uh, and having concluded that life should be lived under God and for God, uh, Solomon now instructs his listeners, his class, uh, those who follow his blog page um, or um, who read his tweets on what to do with the good things of life. And fellow believers, let's realize they are to be enjoyed. They are to be enjoyed. It is not God's purpose that we should have a stiff upper lip and that we can't laugh, that we don't have um, times together when we have barbecues uh, or when we celebrate a birthday or someone uh, maybe going off somewhere for a time or coming back uh, after being away for a time. God wants us to enjoy um, his good gifts that come in his providence into our lives. Look at what he says in verse 9. May I note this? Your wife is a good gift. Do not forget that. Um, live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days. Not the early days. And then you sort of, well, it becomes a bit less in the middle days. And by the time you get into old age, nobody could tell that you loved your wife. No, um, all the days. whom you love all the days. Notice of your vain life. What a blessing it is to come home in the evening from work and to have a wife that you can talk through the day with. What a blessing it is to go out to work knowing that your wife uh, is praying for you as you go and that uh, she appreciates all the support that and provision that you make for her. As I've said before, Scripture does not teach, I don't believe, that a woman cannot work outside the home, a wife cannot work outside the home, but a wife has got to be home-centered, always. And when there's children, she has got to be family-centered. Uh, and so she needs to make sure any work that she does outside the home does not conflict with her primary role, which is to be the helper of her husband, his support, his encouragement, uh, the one who cares for him 
and uh, he loves her and provides for her. So, um, and what a blessing in this vain life. Yes, this life that God has given us, and we are living no longer in the Garden of Eden. We are out of the Garden of Eden. We're living with the thorns and the thistles and the briars, all of those things that when they come to our lives, they can leave one of their little um, pricks in our fingers. And it takes time for it to be taken out. And it takes time for it to be healed and for us to get beyond that. For that is your portion in life and in the toil which you perform. Notice um, he's not saying here that work is toilsome or troublesome or it's an unnecessary evil. Work is a creation ordinance. God created us to work. And it's striking. I was showing some of the photographs earlier of what we were doing yesterday outside the back of the manse. One of our grandchildren came. And he's, what, three years of age? And I was smoothing out sand with a float to get nice and level for the flag going down. He says, Grandpa, can I do that? You see, a child wants to work. Why? Because its parents have said, you must work and you must do this and this and this. No, God has created man to work. And even the little child knows. Boys, you know that you are to work. And when mommy or daddy is doing something, you want to be doing it with them. Don't ever get away from that. Don't ever say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that task because God created us for work and there's things that our children can do even at their early age. Um, and, our, and I'm sure well, this is not in, unusual to us or exceptional to us, but when our children were small, they had to set the table. And then there was a time when they came and they had to do the dishes. And because there were five of them, sometimes there were disagreements. You had to get a rotor going and parcel it all out. And uh, on the Lord's Day, that had to be parceled out as well. So our children tidying their room. Mommy should not have to run around, boys, tidying up after you. You're big enough now to tidy your <coughs> own things. Okay? So, and God wants you to do that. That's part of your training. And mommy and daddy will show you how to do things. That's how you to learn to work in a way that is pleasing to God. So look at what he says then. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. In other words, uh, boys, that means put your heart into it. Okay? Don't be doing something like this here. You know, as if it is going to bite you. If you're being asked to tidy up something. Because it's not going to bite you. Put your heart into it. Get a good grip of it. And take it and put it in the bin. Okay, and wash your hands then, of course, afterwards. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. We work now for God in this world. And we work for his glory. We work as a witness to him. And when you and I go to the grave, there'll be no witness coming from our grave through our work, because there will be no work in the grave. That's what he's saying. But then notice not just a wife and work are good things. Look at what he says about food and drink uh, in these verses as well, verses 7 and 8. And we touched on this last week, and so I'm not going to say a great deal about this today, but this for five times, Solomon talks about eating and drinking uh, with joy, with joy, having happy, joyful occasions together. Um, for God um, has accepted your works. And then, of course, the, the verse 8 is the sign of someone whose life is joyful, uh, white garments. When you were mourning, you were dark garments uh, and you had your face disfigured, but otherwise you put oil in your face and that was because of the sun and that was a sign also that it was an evidence that you had 
good gifts. Um, and so Psalm 23, my head you do with oil anoint, and my cup runs over. And boys, um, whenever a, you receive a gift, don't compare that with what your friends get. And you don't say, well, that's not very much. Mommy and Daddy know what's best for you. Mommy and Daddy could have very different amounts of money and very different things from your friends. So never compare, but always say, thank you, Mom and Dad. And thank you, God, for the good gift and the good gifts that mom and dad provide for us. I think that's something to say about food as well, boys. Mommy's made a nice meal and you get your fork and you push it around the plate. And you maybe try a little bit and push it around the plate again. Um, and you know something, our tastes are something that develop. And so, boys, be adventurous. Say, Mommy, I'm going to try it. Uh, and again, there's all kinds of ways we can do that. Okay, try a little bit of something new this time. Be more the next time and more beyond that again. And I want just to say at this point about food uh, and drink and these kind of social enjoying social occasions. Do we not find this powerfully illustrated? In our Savior. He was the most human of all human beings. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children as gifts from God. That was not God's purpose. And there are people today, and it's not God's purpose that they will have a wife or that they will have children. Um, but that doesn't mean that God's not good to them. He's other things for them to do. But think of the number of references in the gospel to Jesus eating and drinking. Spending time with close friends, um, with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And the scriptures tell us that what we're to do with these occasions together is we're not to indulge. We're not to waste the opportunity. But what does First Timothy say? Sanctify all things with the word of God and prayer. One of our fellowships said some time ago, we're not eating again, are we? Uh, or we are eating again. Well, that's a good thing in a church, that we sit together, we eat together, and we have time to share our lives uh, together. So let's go back again briefly now to the question of the non-Christian who says, well, God is not good. There is no God. Why can there be a God when there's so much evil? And I think while we answer that question, uh, giving as much as we can in the light of what we said for, so far, I think there's also a place for turning the question around and saying, why is there so much good? Think about all the good things you have in your life. Where do they come from? And why are they here? Are they not evidences uh, of... Um, God and his goodness. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And so we can focus in with the non-Christian. Look at all the good things you enjoy. And do you know what God wants of you? God commands you to repent and to recognize that he is the source of everything that you have in your life. So don't allow people to drive you down the road of the evil around us and try and corner you. Uh, we say what we can say in the four points of our framework. And then we say, but what about the good? And get them focusing on the good that they enjoy. That brings us then, um, secondly or fourthly, whichever way you want to count, um, to outcomes. And we're looking now uh, at verses 11 uh, through to 18 of this uh, chapter. And outcomes in life are under God's control, not our control. When we're young, we dream dreams, don't we? 
I'd be interested to hear what you boys want to be when you grow up. You're dreaming dreams. Ask your daddy, is he what he once dreamt uh, when about when he was a boy? And your mummy. And the likelihood is they'll say no, because we have dreams, we have plans, we have ideas, but ultimately. Uh, life is full of the unexpected, the unknown, the unplanned for from our point of view, but not from God's point of view. Sometimes things work out much better than we had dreamed. At other times, things take a different direction that we hadn't anticipated. Look at what the writer or what the teacher Solomon says in verse 11. The race. Well, you'd think, who do you think would win the race? The fastest. Isn't that right? But look at what it says. The race is not to the fastest. And who do you think would win the battle? Well, we would say, let the strongest man win. Let the strongest army win. But that's not always the case. And what about the person who's bred? Well, surely it's the farmer. It's the person, not just the farmer, but the household that's wise, that looks after their money, uh, that is diligent and hardworking. But that's not always the case either. Nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. Solomon says this is the great reality. And then look at what he says. And but time and um, my version, which is New King James, has the word chance. That's not, this word's only used once as a noun, chan, uh, and it's translated chance here. But there's a verb which means to occur or to happen. And I think that's a better translation. But time and event, time and occurrence, time and happening, we might say. Things that we can't control, the weather. Um, we can't control how an exam will go. We can't control if you're going out for your driving test. That it's going to be a nice, quiet day, and the roads are going to be lovely, and you're going to get the best instructor, and there's no re or the best examiner, and there's no rain, and everything goes swimmingly. We can't guarantee that because there's such a thing as time, and there's such a thing as happening or events or things that we don't foresee, things that we don't control. But that does not mean that they're not foreseen by God. That does not mean they're not under the control of God. Look at the death of Christ. And it seemed as if to the people around about, evil had gotten the victory, and it seemed as if everything was out of control. But what do we read? What did Peter say in one of his sermons? God ordained. God knew beforehand. God, and doesn't mean he just knew beforehand. God decided beforehand. God determined in eternity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that Christ would come and go to the cross. And yet the evil men are also responsible. So Judas was in the hand of God. Pilate was in the hand of God. The Roman soldiers were in the hand of God. Time and event is under the control of God. You do not control time. We, are, we tried to keep time, and the American team referred to colder time, which was always a wee bit late when we're picking them up. We try to keep time, but we do not control time. We do not control time. We do not control events. We can make the best plans. We can do the hardest work. We can study uh, when we're at school and do everything that is ours, that is our responsibility to do. And we go into an exam and it's a nightmare from our point of view. It was my own experience at A-levels. But I look back now and I see the places I wanted to go to, they would have been really bad for me spirit. And God took me to Belfast, kept me in Northern Ireland, brought me into contact with the Reformed Presbyterians, 
with a solid Christian union in Jordanstown. I met my wife, whom I will love all the days of my life. Um, and as the saying is, the rest that has happened this far is history. And what happens beyond this is in the hands of God. It's in his time, and it will be determined by the events that he sends into, um, into our lives. With somebody helping us yesterday to do the paving stones, or lay down the flags, and he, he said um, something about, well, maybe we'll have to do this again. And I said, no. I said, the next call that I'm waiting for is to heaven. There's no more calls. That's the next call that I'm waiting for. Um, so I think he was implying maybe I would end up moving congregation and there'd be another backyard uh, to be done. So God is in control of time and God is in control of events. And so how wonderful that is um, that when we have a life that is marked by wisdom, that is God-centered, that is looking to Christ, we don't have to get ourselves anxious. How many people today are anxious, living in a state of perpetual fear and anxiety? What if? And they're, they dri they're driving themselves uh, to distraction and their, their life is, is tyrannical. Well, that's not what God plans for us. He wants us always to remember, even when there are pressures and stresses in our lives, he is in control. Outcomes are under his control. And outcomes are determined by, in his time, and by the events that he allows to come into our lives. There's a lovely phrase uh, in the confession, and I'm going to close with this. Uh, it's the chapter in Providence, and uh, chapter 5, the paragraph 2. It's talking about the knowledge, the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause. And he says, all things come to pass without change uh, and infallibly. Uh, yet by the same providence, God orders them to fall out, to happen, according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. So we are to find comfort in these things, brethren. In this world, in this life where there is so much that is uh, inexplicable. And the, he gives an example then in verses 13 to 18 uh, as he rounds off this fourth point. He says, here's a, here's a wise man and he delivers a city against a mighty army. and um, they, nobody even thinks about it afterwards. Nobody even perhaps stops to say thank you. Have you ever found that in your life? You've done something for someone? And it has been really, you haven't realized it, but it's been really significant in their life. Uh, or you're saying something, or you have some influence as part of a group, and nobody even stops to say thank you. Well, in a sense, we don't really need people to stop to say thank you. It's a good thing to do for the encouragement of one another's brethren in Christ, but we remember that God sees all things. He knows all things. And when we live our lives centered on him and looking to Christ, and we uh, work that out in difficult situations, and it's for the good of other people, the Lord will not forget what we do in his name. For there's no unrighteousness in him. Amen.